Rats are crawling all over the house of the dragon, but are they just a metaphor or something more? And where have we seen that mysterious red flower before? For several weeks in a row, various rodents have scurried in and out of frame on House of the Dragon. In episode 6, Viserys spots a mouse on a mantle as he's alone in his bedchamber. As viewers see Alaris tell Queen Alicent about the weakness of children. But the most overt inclusion of a rat is the one that drinks the recently deceased Sir Joffrey Longmust's blood as Rhaenyra and Laenor exchange their vows in episode 5. Many readers of Fire and Blood feel like the rats are an indicator of an upcoming plotline. That's if the show follows the book would be a huge spoiler. So we'll say no more about that here. But King's Landing's prominent vermin problem might have another explanation. Though there's no textual evidence for this theory in George R. R. Martin's writing, Reddit moderator and YouTuber Joe Magician has laid out the possibility that a character on House of the Dragon could be a skin changer, like Bran Stark. If so, the rats could be being used to spy and gather information. Ten years on, it seems like every move mortal enemies Princess Rhaenyra and Queen Alicent make is a power play. Episode 6 opens with Rhaenyra's delivery of her third child. Just about the moment the midwife places the baby in the princess's arms, a messenger arrives to take the newborn to the queen's chambers. Rhaenyra will not have her son separated from her so quickly. Before she's even past the placenta, she dresses to make the long walk through the Red Keep. Her husband, Laenor Valarian, accompanies her and holds her upright, as she has to stop each time she has an afterbirth contraction. During one of these moments on the stairs, Lord Caswell and his lady wife approach Rhaenyra and Laenor enthusiastically. If I may be of any service… The day may yet come, my lord. This seems like a subtle bit of foreshadowing on the show's part, as prominent families begin to take sides. House Caswell appears to be staunchly loyal to Rhaenyra as tension and uncertainty about the succession mounts, and that loyalty will likely soon be tested in dramatic fashion. After Rhaenyra wills herself to the Queen's private quarters, she presents the newborn prince to Alicent, who's basically become her evil stepmother, and her father, King Viserys, who's shockingly still alive, though just barely. Viserys is genuinely happy to meet the child, and remarks that he thinks the boy has his father's nose. When the queen asks what they'll call him, Rhaenyra begins to say that they haven't decided, but then Laenor bursts out the name Joffrey, which probably made Game of Thrones fans perk up. But the name is a reference to another murderer Joffrey from nearly two centuries prior, and Alicent can't hide her feelings about it. It's an unusual name for Valerian. With this polite enough sounding comment, Alicent is actually making two accusations. Though we only met him briefly, Joffrey was the first name of Laenor's lover, Sir Joffrey Lonmouth, the Knight of Kisses, who was brutally murdered by Sir Kristen Cole at the Welcome Feast in Episode 5. Laenor and Joffrey's relationship was an open secret, at least at Driftmark, and probably even at King's Landing. Still, for the Queen to underscore the fact that the future King Consort wants to name his purported son after his murdered boyfriend is remarkably bold. Alicent is also implying that she knows this child, like the previous two, isn't really Laenor's, since she's well aware of his sexual preferences. Do keep trying, Selena. Sooner or later you may get what it looks like you. King Viserys' small council has changed considerably over the years. Corlys Valarian has been replaced by Tyland Lannister as Master of Ships. When Otto Hightower was dismissed as Hand of the King, Lionel Strong was chosen to fulfill that most important role. Only Lyman Beesbury remains in his original position of Master of Coin. But two of the most notable changes to the King's Council are the addition of his daughter, Princess Rhaenyra, and his wife, Queen Alicent. Rhaenyra was promoted from cupbearer to council member after being named heir and Princess of Dragonstone. A decade later, a much more politically active Alicent also has a seat at the table. Production designers conceived of small spheres to signify a character's presence at the small council table, each in colors that represent the great houses to which the council members belong. Queen Alicent sits behind a green ball that's reminiscent of Hightower's colors and her infamous gown while Rhaenyra rolls her fingers across a black one for House Targaryen. These totems demonstrate that both have accumulated immense power in the last decade, regardless of their opposition to each other. Earlier in the season, it was frowned upon for the princess to speak at all when she's with the lords behind the closed doors of the small council room. Now she and Alicent are practically running the show, though they seem to disagree about everything. We met Lionel Strong's son, Harwin and Laris during the hunt in Episode 3. 
Larys has since ingratiated himself to Queen Alicent by becoming her an official master of whisperers, while Harwin has entangled himself in some deadly serious palace drama by fathering Rhaenyra's three children. Savvy viewers will have noticed that Harwin was quite taken with Rhaenyra after she killed the boar and when she donned the boy's clothing on the Street of Silk. He's also the one that carries her to safety after the melee at the welcome feast. Larys doesn't seem to have a very high opinion of his father, the Hand, or his brother. When Queen Alicent complains that King Viserys wouldn't accept Lionel's resignation after Harwin attacks Sir Criston in the training yard, Larys graduates from whispers to action. Lionel takes Harwin to the family seat of Harrenhal, which is said to be cursed to avoid persistent rumors of the prince's parentage. Meanwhile, Larys frees some of King's Landing's most dangerous prisoners, so long as they're okay with him cutting off their tongues so they can't spill the beans. He sends his assassins to Harrenhal to murder his father and brother via arson, which he tells a horrified Alicent that she'll thank him for later, as he holds the foreign flower to which he previously compared her. An outsider among the natives. Lord Larys. In Fire and Blood, Larys isn't just master of whisperers, he's Lord Confessor. That title is a euphemism for torture-in-chief, so it's no surprise to book readers that he's so eager to break out the tools of his trade. 